Yeah, yeah. So are we ready to start? I think we should. I think we should. We should. Great, great. So welcome to this uh, uh, important session of optimizing cardiovascular care. And uh, I'm Dr. Upendra Paul, and with me is Dr. Natarajan, who will be chairing the session. And our first speaker is already here, and uh, we welcome Dr. Greg C. Farno. He's going to speak on optimal initiation of guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What the unmet needs are, and how do we address them? Greg? It's all yours. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to uh, present on this uh, topic about optimal implementation of guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients, the NMET needs, and how do we address them. Heart failure is really common, costly, and deadly. You can see the statistics here from the United States, but really this is a global problem. Despite a number of treatment advances, we still, however, have eligible patients not treated with one or more of our mortality reducing therapies, and thus are having hospitalizations and fatal events that could have been prevented with better implementation. In addition, we have additional therapies that have become available and ensuring that they're implemented consistently and to all eligible patients really can make a huge difference. This is data generated in the US looking at patients diagnosed with heart failure and their life expectancy median survival compared to the general population. And you can see even for patients 65 to 69, greater than 15 years loss of life Prominent with being diagnosed with heart failure. So these patients are really at substantial risk by their natural history. Now, fortunately, we have a number of evidence-based medications, guideline recommended, that have been shown in multiple randomized clinical trials to reduce not only cardiovascular mortality hospitalizations, but also all-cause mortality. The relative risk reductions in all-cause mortality are shown here the number needed to treat standardized for 36 months. And most of these therapies also produce substantial reduction in hospitalizations. And these therapies are additive, incremental to each other. So therefore we really have the tools that can markedly improve upon the natural history. But when we look at study after study in setting um, all really inpatient, outpatient in a variety of healthcare systems, we see marked underutilization as well as marked underdosing of the medications relative to the clinical trials. This is from a recent US CHAMP HF registry that I've led. And you can see for therapies such as Secubitril Valsartan, Aldosterone and Tegnus, marked treatment gaps with these therapies. And you can also see dosing that often patients are on much lower doses even in the absence, contraindications or intolerance. And when we asked the question, how many patients were on three major therapies at that time at target dose, it was less than 1% of patients. So huge treatment gap. Now we know from our trials that these therapies are actually truly additive to each other, that adding one beneficial therapy to the other is not redundant, but is actually fully additive. And so as we look at the clinical trial evidence, that becomes evident. This is for the landmark beta blocker trials where there was high background use of ACE inhibitor ARBs, but yet an incremental 34 to 35% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality. With aldosterone and Tegnist, although the Rawls trial was spironolactone, there was relatively low use of beta blockers. We see in the more recent emphasis HF in milder heart failure at plerinone, a significant reduction in all-cause mortality with high ACE inhibitor, ARB, and beta blocker use. So the MRA is truly additive to background therapy. Now, with Secubitril Valsartan replacing an ACE inhibitor ARB, we see the addition of neprilysin inhibition giving us remarkable benefit on the primary composite for cardiovascular death and for all-cause mortality, despite very high use 
a beta blocker and MRA as background therapy. And you can see the very impressive uh, P values and numbers needed to treat. So by replacing an ACE inhibitor ARB with CQB12 SR, we can further improve survival. In fact, for cardiovascular mortality compared to an ARB or ACE inhibitor, the addition of a naprolysin inhibition and use of CQB12 SR doubles the benefit with regards to cardiovascular mortality. We see the benefits were uniform across heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and truly additive irrespective of background medical therapy. So this is truly a population-wide benefit for heart failure with reduced EF. And we could not identify any subgroup of patient better off being left on the ACE inhibitor or ARB. Our newest class of therapy that in the last year or two has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are the SGLT2 inhibitors, working not just in those with type 2 diabetes, but even those with heart failure with reduced EF in the absence of diabetes. The remarkable data from DAP-AHF and more recently from Emperor Reduce here is the meta-analysis from the Lancet, where we see reductions in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular death, and the composite of hospitalization for heart failure and CV death. And this is truly additive to the other evidence-based therapies. And this is illustrated here for DAP-AHF, regardless of MRA use, ARNI use, there is this additive benefit. So if we look at the cumulative benefits of our evidence-based heart failure therapies, they're profound. The two-year mortality by natural history and heart failure reduced EF, one in three patients will die. The successive use of these agents and altogether a 74% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality, 26% absolute risk reduction, NNT to save a life uh, less than four. Now, a key question is, though, how should we sequence these medications and initiate them? Should we follow the historical approach used in clinical trials, or should we think of a more innovative approach of starting all of the effective therapies right off the bat? Now, this slide illustrates the downside of historical or vintage sequencing, starting off with an ACE inhibitor and up titrating over time before then adding the beta blocker up titrating, then starting the MRA and up titrating, then and only then to switch to CQB12 Valsartan, and then and only then start the SGLT2 inhibitor. It means 24, 52 weeks will go by before we get to what we would define as optimal guideline-directed medical therapy. This could be okay if it takes months or years till there's benefit, but in fact, what our trials have shown remarkable early benefits with each of these medications. This is data for carbetalol, where within two weeks in the Copernicus trial, survival curves are diverging. Within the first eight weeks, markedly less likely to develop worsened heart failure, even among the sickest heart failure patients with this therapy. The benefits and emphasis with the uh, MRA were seen within two weeks, the survival curves were diverging. We see the remarkable data in Pioneer of starting Secuba 12 Osartan versus ACE in a veteran hospital. This isn't in weeks, this is in days where the event curves have diverged, are highly significant within 30 days, and the 6% absolute risk reduction. So, delaying initiation of Secuba 12 Osartan to go with an ACE in first leaves substantial risk on the table. This is data from three different SGLT2 inhibitor trials and heart failure reduced DF. We see benefits that are statistically significant and of large magnitude in the first 28 days of initiation. The latest data from Soloist where therapy was started in hospital and heart failure. We also see major health status improvement. So I would advocate the ideal sequencing in the hemodynamically stabilized patient at the time of diagnosis, whether hospitalized or outpatient, is to start at the low heart failure recommended dosing, the QB12 valsartan and beta blocker MRA and SGLT2 inhibitor together. Focus and prioritize the titration at the beta blocker that gives us the greatest dose response. And then the other therapies, SGLT2 inhibitor, the first dose requires no titration. And then once on, on that optimal treatment, additional therapies can be considered and we can get a huge magnitude of benefit. So here are all the 
optimal benefits from simultaneous initiation of guideline-directed medical therapy, rapid improvement in health status, rapid reversal, remodeling, reduction of hospitalization, rehospitalization, mortality, as well as better adherence, persistence, and overcoming clinical inertia. What do I mean by clinical inertia? This is data from CHAMP HF, where you can see over a 12-month period, very little adjustment, titration, initiation of guideline-directed medical therapy. So once a patient's on a regimen, unlikely for additional therapies to be added outpatient or up titrated, we can overcome this inertia with a simultaneous strategy. There are additional strategies we can use to improve guideline-directed medical therapy in hospital initiation, use of performance improvement systems, multidisciplinary heart failure disease management programs, use of navigators, guideline-directed medical therapy clinics, telehealth, and patient activation tools. Now, what about the value, right? Some of these therapies are more expensive, others available generically. Is it worth the value and effort to navigate this and get patients treated. So this is a recent analysis did with colleagues looking at the landmark trials and a network type analysis, looking at the cumulative benefit of going from an ACE inhibitor ARB and beta blocker onto comprehensive disease modifying medical therapy, the four pillar meds we just covered. And you can see the tremendous relative risk reduction events. What does this mean to patient survival? It's shown here. Survival free from cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization by following these three steps extended by 8.3 years and all cause mortality survival extension, 6.3 years. So the value of extending median survival up and beyond what was prior standard therapy is really quite phenomenal and cost effective. So these four pillar medications, the cubitril valsartan evidence-based beta blocker aldosterone antagonist SGLT2 inhibitor together, we can have tremendous impact. The time to start is right from the time of diagnosis. This is the population-wide benefit that would occur in the U.S. with optimal implementation. We could save 130,000 lives per year, thus supplying these therapies optimally eligible patients. So the benefits of our heart failure reduced ejection fraction meds are additive and incremental. No substantial overlaps been demonstrated. Optimal approaches to utilize each of these medications in combination, so long as not contraindicated, and start without delay. A more serial or selective approach leads to delays, leads to clinical inertia, and thus use of secubitril, valsartan, beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitor together provide high economic and clinical value and should be the preferred approach. Thank you so much for your attention today and I'm delighted to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Greg. It was a wonderful and uh, take home message that start them early, start them together. Don't go sequential and don't waste, you know, the very precious time of you know, first two, uh, three to four weeks because many patients, if you start inadequately in half the doses, hesitantly come back within a couple of weeks, which is not only demoralizing for the patient, the physician, but also for the natural history of heart failure. You know, yes, he gets, you know, he's not the same as he was at discharge. So I think that's very, very important. and. And do you find, Greg, any difficulty in, uh, you know, approaching this uh, concept which you said in your concluding slide? What about the, you know, the practicing cardiologists? Have they started using this practice or they still go by the trial basis of paradigm, heart failure, start another pill then this thing and then go like this? And... Yeah, so it's a great question. And most of my heart failure colleagues are utilizing this approach from a pure medical standpoint. There are a number of advantages. Patients are less likely to have worsening. And sometimes as you start a med and that patient's, their heart failure is worsening, the patient believes, oh, it's due to the medication that's just been started rather than their underlying condition. So tolerability and adherence is really enhanced by this approach. There are some challenges for certain patients where there are formulary restrictions and access challenges and still cost barriers. So it is more the logistics that are the issues rather than the medical approach 
um, in managing the patients this way. And as we get these therapies started, many are complementary. You're less likely to get hyperkalemia, say with CQB12 valsartan with the MRA than with the ACE inhibitor. Less likely to get hyperkalemia with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Less likely to need higher doses of loop diuretics. So there are a number of synergistic advantages in the management and simplification of the regimen that are very helpful. Where does ivaprodine figure in, in your protocol? Yeah, so it's a, a great question. You know, current US guidelines and ESC guidelines give this a, a two-way recommendation. There was not in the shift trial reduction in all-cause mortality. So we not view it as one of the prioritized medications. But for those where you've tried maximally tolerated beta blocker therapy and remain in sinus rhythm, heart rate above 70, is a reasonable addition to reduce hospitalization risk. But what's key there is you've really made a good attempt to initiate and maximize that beta blocker dose. We know some patients, though, that can't tolerate beta blockers, and in which case there's a very large benefit the rabidine and the heart rate lowering. So it does have an important role, but it's not one of the foundational medications for heart failure with reduced DF. Yeah, Dr. Natarajan, we still have two minutes. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, he said logistic reasons is one of the reasons why the GDMT is not started at the time they should ideally be started. Uh, any other reasons uh, you think in the Indian context, Cost is a concern. So you start the most essential of all drugs. Obviously, beta blockers are started in a, a large number of patients, even in the Indian context. But this one after the other, taking own sweet time, happens in a very slow fashion in the Indian context. More, uh, one of the reasons is physician inertia also. And it is compounded by uh, the patient's ability to afford the cost of medicines because most of the medicines are actually out-of-pocket uh, purchase of medicines. So in, the, in, the, in the, the Western context, why there is a delay uh, apart from, you said logistic reasons. Can you elaborate, please? Yeah, thanks for that question and point. And I agree, it's not just patient inertia, right? It's the clinician inertia that's driving this. And a lot of it is the historical approach. Oh, at the time I train, this is how we sequence medications. So I view the newer medications to be last added on. There are cost barriers, even patients who have prescription drug coverage, their co-payments may be high enough that that serves as a barrier. So there's a host of these issues that come into play. And sometimes even when the patient has prescription coverage, that physician has a reluctance given prior experience of patients having difficulty paying where they're reluctant to try again. So we really need a more systematic approach um, to overcome these barriers so patients can derive benefit. Because of course, you know, the health system is bearing the cost of these early rehospitalizations. And so, you know, from a value standpoint to society, you know, it would be worthwhile to facilitate access, even provide the medications free of charge and still come out financially ahead. So we do need to overcome these true financial barriers and prioritize those medications that are going to best improve outcomes. There are other medications that are more expensive that are not reducing mortality that may be able to be stopped. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, let's move to uh, my friend Sripal Bangalore from New York, who is going to talk about another very important subject of optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with acute coronary syndrome, especially focusing on impact of stent design and polymer composition. Sripal. Sir, you are muted, sir. Please unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, very well. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for having me on this uh, conference. Um, I was asked to speak on a different topic. So I was supposed to talk on two different subjects. One was the ischemia trial, 
and this was supposed to be on Thursday, but I had an emergency in the cath lab that uh, you know I couldn't get out of. And so today uh, I was asked to speak on ischemia. So we'll just switch topics. Maybe I think it may be um, kind of um, a better fit. I mean, after hearing Dr. Foranar's talk, I think it kind of uh, fits into the realm of uh, management of stable ischemic heart disease. So in the next few minutes, I will talk about the ischemia trial in perspective and what, what it does in terms of implication for decision-making for the management of patients with stable uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, in terms of relevant disclosures, I have grant support from NHLBI for the ischemia and the ischemia CKD trials. And um, I have this slide as a, a brief summary about the ischemia trial. Um, uh, so I wanted to condense all of the information that we have been presenting over the last one year into one of the slides here. So in the ischemia trial, we randomized 5,179 patients and they were randomized to either an invasive strategy of cardiac catheterization um, along with optimal medical therapy um, versus a conservative strategy we started with optimal medical therapy alone. So to put this in perspective with all of the trials so far, this is the largest treatment strategy trial of stable ischemic heart disease. So it's larger than combined courage and Barry 2D uh, trials uh, together. So 5,179 patients. We enrolled a high risk subset of patients. The entry country criteria for the ischemia trial was patients should have at least moderate or severe ischemia on a stress test. And in fact, if you look at what did we achieve um, at the end of the trial, 54% of the patient had core lab determined severe ischemia. And in fact, if you look at uh, coronary CT, uh, which uh, a good proportion of these patients had, 76% of patients had multivessel coronary artery disease. And in fact, nearly half of them had proximal LAD disease on coronary CT. I mean, this is uh, defined by 50% of greater uh, stenosis. So we did manage to enroll a pretty high risk uh, subgroup of patients. In the patients who underwent an uh, invasive strategy, 80% uh, of them un underwent uh, revascularization. And the key thing to emphasize is 74% uh, of this revascularization was by PCI, but we had a good proportion or 26% of patients underwent uh, CABIT. So uh, again, there is some misconception that ischemia is a PCI trial, but I want to emphasize it was, uh, we had 26% of patients who underwent CABIT. In the conservative strategy, we had a median follow-up of around uh, four years. 28% uh, of them uh, underwent CATH over a period of four years with 23% of them undergoing revascularization. And if you exclude the revascularization that were done as part of a primary endpoint event, only 16% at four years underwent uh, revascularization. So around 4% a year uh, revascularization in the conservative uh, strategy. If you look at medication therapy in the trial, so we did achieve a high uh, proportion of medication use. 95% of the enrolled uh, randomized patients were on a statins. Nearly two thirds were on a high intensity statin the achieved median uh, LDL cholesterol was 64, and achieved uh, systolic blood pressure was around uh, 129. So with that in background, let's look at uh, revascularization in uh, stable ischemic heart disease. What are the potential reasons? The first reason uh, to consider is if a therapy ha can improve survival. So can a revascularization improve survival in stable ischemic heart disease? So if you look at the data leading up to the ischemia trial from randomized trial, so this is COURAGE trial 2007, no difference in death, BARRY 2D trial 2009, no difference in death, FAME2 trial 2012, no difference in death. The consistent message is, seems to be that there is no difference in mortality in patients with stable ischemic heart disease with revascularization therapy. What did we see in ischemia? So this is the ischemia trial, and this is the curves for all-cause mortality. Again, invasive conservative strategy, you see that the two curves are superimposed, no difference in mortality, uh, even in the ischemia trial. The ischemia CKD trial is a trial that I led, uh, enrolling patients with GFR less than 30 with moderate or severe ischemia, randomized to invasive versus conservative. Again, in the, tr in this, in the trial, very high event rates, close to over 25% mortality at three years, but again, no difference between invasive and conservative strategy for all-cause mortality. We published this analysis. This is a meta-analysis of all of the randomized trials of stable ischemic heart disease. And what we see here for the endpoint of all-cause mortality, again, no significant difference in mortality between revascularization versus medical therapy, even if you look at the latest trials, the stent group of trials, which includes the ischemia trial, the FAME2 trial, et cetera. 
So this seems to be a consistent message that uh, radiovascularization does not improve survival in stable ischemic heart disease. But the question has always been, what about high-risk subgroup of patients? So if you look at the guidelines, uh, some of the high-risk subgroups of patients are patients with left main disease, those with LV dysfunction, triple vessel disease, proximal LAD, and those with extensive ischemia. And depending on whether it's the ACCHA or the ESC guidelines, you do see that the guidelines do recommend revascularization to improve survival in some of these high-risk subsets. Does ischemia change this equation? So if you first focus on left main disease, so the data on left main disease is based on three trials which were done in the 80s. So these were cabbage versus no cabbage trials. And Salim Youssef published this meta-analysis combining these three trials where they showed that for the left main subgroup of patients, uh, there was a significant mortality benefit of cabbage when compared to no cabbage. And of course, this is only based on 150 patients from these uh, randomized trials. So there is data, uh, at least back in the day, cabbage, uh, extends survival in patients with left main disease, but this is based on 150 patients from those randomized trials. Subsequent trials have consistently excluded patients with left main disease. Even in those trials, so for example, this is the VA cooperative uh, trial, um, we see that the benefit of uh, revascularization in left main really depends on how severe the left main stenosis is. If the severity is greater than 75%, uh, they the absolute benefit of revascularization is far greater than when the uh, uh, left main stenosis severity is 50 to 70%. What about patients with LV dysfunction? So uh, ischemia excluded uh, patients with left main, also excluded patients with LV dysfunction. We have the stitch and the stitches data. Cabbage compared to medical therapy in patients with LV systolic dysfunction, significant mortality benefit of cabbage when compared to medical therapy, a number needed to treat of only 14. So at least in these two subsets, left main and LV dysfunction, we see that there is data to support uh, uh, extension of survival with the revascularization when compared to medical therapy alone. What about triple vessel disease? Uh, if you go back to the 1980s and Salim use of meta-analysis of cabbage versus no cabbage trials, in the subgroup with triple vessel disease, there is there was indeed a, a improvement in survival, extension of survival was six months in patients who have three triple vessel disease. However, I must point out that there was hardly any medical therapy. Um, and you know, uh, you heard clearly from Greg in terms of heart failure patients and what we have done in terms of progress in medical therapy. And the same has happened in the field of uh, stable ischemic heart disease. If you look at 2009 BADI-2D trial, uh, if you look at the cabbage subset, uh, where majority of patients did have multivessel disease, triple vessel disease, and now when you compare cabbage versus medical therapy, uh, in the 80s, survival benefit in 2009, no difference in survival in diabetic triple vessel disease uh, with cabbage when compared to medical therapy alone. Uh, we do have data from the ischemia trial. Uh, so this is a primary endpoint based on number of vessel disease and coronary CT. And as you can see, no difference between invasive and conservative strategy, no heterogeneity of treatment uh, effect, even in patients who have triple vessel disease. In fact, earlier this year, we presented data on mortality um, as an endpoint, and we showed exactly the same results that no significant mortality difference between uh, invasive conservative strategy, even in patients who had triple vessel disease. What about patients with proximal LAD uh, stenosis? Again, data from ischemia trial, whether patients had no proximal LAD or proximal LAD did not really matter, no heterogeneity of treatment effect. And again, earlier this year at ACC, we presented results on the endpoint of all-cause mortality, no significant difference and no heterogeneity of treatment effect based on proximal LAD uh, disease uh, status. So uh, what are the other reasons to consider revascularization in patients with stable ischemic heart disease? So one, as we talked about, to improve survival, uh, but if you cannot improve survival, maybe preventing other cardiovascular endpoint is, a, is an important uh, endpoint to consider. Uh, so this is data from uh, ischemia trial uh, looking at other endpoints. Uh, in ischemia, we showed that the invasive strategy was associated with significant increase in procedural MI. But uh, if you look at spontaneous MI, there was a significant uh, decrease, a 33% reduction in mortal, uh, uh, spontaneous MI with invasive strategy when compared to a uh, conservative strategy. So we published, uh, Bernie Chaitman is the lead author. We published uh, the MI endpoint in circulation last week, uh, where we showed that spontaneous MI was more closely uh, related to uh, subsequent cardiovascular mortality when compared to procedural MI. Uh, 
So now if you look at overall, all of the trials, this is data from a meta-analysis that we published, looking at the endpoint of myocardial infarction. And what we see is in the more recent trials, this 10 trials, there is an 11% 11 decrease in myocardial infarction with revascularization when compared to medical therapy alone. And in fact, in this same meta-analysis, what we have shown is, uh, if you look at uh, the data from all of these randomized trials, revascularization increases procedural MI, it significantly reduces spontaneous MI, significantly reduces unstable angina, and no difference in other endpoints. So we do see that uh, revascularization does have a benefit at reducing um, other cardiovascular events. And finally, one of the other reasons to consider revascularization to improve quality of life. Um, so this is the data from the ischemia trial looking at quality of life. The red ones is for invasive, the blue is for the conservative strategy. What we showed in ischemia trial is there is the sustained and durable improvement in quality of life with revascularization, with invasive strategy when compared to conservative strategy. Uh, the difference when you look at the courage and Barry 2D is that in ischemia, this difference was long lasting up to uh, 48 months of follow-up. So in courage, as you know, um, the difference between uh, revascularization and medical therapy, uh, quality of life outcomes waned off after three years. In Barry 2D, there was no significant difference after one year with PCI when compared to uh, medical therapy alone. The difference here is, of course, uh, this is using the best available technology, second generation drug eluding stents, uh, cabbage in select patients, uh, optimizing PCI using uh, FFR, and of course, added on to uh, guideline directed uh, medical therapy. So if you were to put the sum everything together, so this is uh, data from all of the randomized trials, close to 15,000 patients with stable ischemic heart disease. So it's important to recognize that, that uh, these results do not apply. Most of the patients enrolled in these trials had an uh, almost preserved EF, a 35% or greater uh, EF. They were tended to be less symptomatic, CCS class one or two. In um, all trials excluded patients with significant left main disease in these trials, if the patients were randomized to routine revascularization, 71% underwent PCI, 16% underwent cabbage, and 12%, even though they were randomized to revascularization, underwent medical therapy alone for various reasons, including not having obstructive disease. If you choose a strategy of initial medical therapy, over a period of uh, four years, a third of them cross over and have uh, uh, a revascularization. So uh, just to summarize, so data from 65,000 patients you follow from randomized trials of routine revascularization versus initial medical therapy suggests that one in three patients in the initial medical therapy will undergo revascularization over uh, 4.5 years of follow-up. There is similar uh, survival between the two groups. Revascularization reduces non-procedural MI, unstable angina. There is a greater freedom from angina, uh, but this is at the cost of increased uh, procedural MI. So if you look at patients, uh, revascularization to improve survival in a high-risk subgroup of patients, we do have data to improve survival in left main disease and LV dysfunction, but not in these other subgroups of patients, which we have considered it as a high-risk, triple vessel peroxylady and extensive uh, ischemia. And so some of the other reasons to consider revascularization are a durable benefit at uh, reducing angina-related quality of life and reduction in spontaneous MI. And I think what ischemia does is uh, emphasizing the need for a good patient uh, uh, physician discussion and patient uh, preference uh, really matters. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sripal, and uh, for re-emphasizing the importance of optimal medical treatment in stable ischemic heart disease. And uh, if the goal is uh, survival, if the goal is reduction in MIs, it really doesn't make any difference. And quality of life depends from the person to this person and not too much of a tremendous difference. But where do you stop? You know, when do you, which patient of uh, stable angina do you investigate? Why should we be investigating them? Where should we yeah, do no, I... angiograms? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, um, as you know, you were uh, one of the country leaders for the ischemia trial and India did great in enrolling uh, patients uh, for, for the tri trial, um, for both the trials, ischemia and ischemia CKD. Um, so uh, ischemia was not designed to answer what should be the uh, workup for patients with uh, coronary artery disease. 
So my take on this is uh, the following. So if you have a patient where the symptoms are classic and it's stable uh, coronary artery disease, it really depends on what the patient wants to do. So you can pr uh, give both option of either you want to do an invasive strategy or uh, you know, try medical therapy first. Uh, you know, I've had patients like who are avid bikers and like, you know, they want to run marathons, et cetera. And even if it is a class two uh, symptoms, they don't like it. And in, in such patients, so if they're very symptomatic and they choose invasive strategy, I skip everything. I say, okay, let's just do a cath and, um, and you know, uh, revascularization if that is what they want. Other patients, if they want to try medical therapy, then the question is, uh, what do we do next? I mean, I am slightly biased towards saying uh, anatomic uh, definition is better. So coronary CT would be my preferred uh, approach, mainly because also in the ischemia trial, what we saw was even though patients had moderate to severe ischemia, 20% did not have obstructive disease. And in 10% of them, they had, there was left main disease. So if you, uh, for a, such a patient, if you just throw in medical therapy, you may be over treating these 20% who have no coronary artery disease. So I think establishing a diagnosis is important. And of course, I do think that stress testing has a role. And uh, in, in a way I do like the nice guidelines um, as to, uh, you know, if you're diagnosing it, maybe CCTA uh, first may be a better approach. Uh, but if they have known coronary artery disease, if you want to risk stratify them, a non-invasive uh, stress testing may be ideal also. Yeah. So, any more questions? Uh, Dr. Sripal, uh, post ischemia trial, uh, is there a sea change in the way uh, chronic stable angina is being treated in the American context? I can uh, kind of reasonably say that in the Indian context, little has actually been uh, little, little has actually changed. How is the scenario in uh, in in the West, particularly in the U.S., where you are working? Uh, has it brought about a huge change in the way people treat chronic stable angina? You know, so I, I, as you all know, that uh, any clinical trial, I think, uh, especially a strategy trial, it takes a while before it gets implemented. What we are seeing more and more is uh, more of a discussion. And I think that's exactly what we wanted. So there is more discussion. Because previously, I can tell you, if a patient has severe uh, ischemia, they would be rushed to the cath lab the same day. Uh, so now people now look, you don't have to be worried. I mean, it's not, the patient are not going to drop dead if they have severe ischemia. You have time. You can take your time. So I think that's one uh, change that we have seen. And we've also seen like there is uh, awareness among uh, patients and physicians. And there is there has been a discussion both ways, uh, you know, considering medical therapy first. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have also had a lot of discussion about, you know, the previously we used to say a patient needs to be on two antianginals before you can revascularize. The question is, do we really need that? If a patient really says, uh, this is exactly what I want, I don't want to try medical therapy uh, for a protracted period of time. If that is what they want, they can opt for revascularization uh, upfront. So I think we are seeing a conversation. I haven't seen, uh, we haven't, I haven't seen any data showing that there has been a significant change uh, but hopefully that will come in the next uh, few years. And of course, as part of being on the guideline writing committee, we're also discussing many of this and it will be reflected in the next guidelines. Okay, very good. So I think we can go to the next session. Yeah. Yeah, please handle it. Yeah. So Dr. Sadia is with us and she's going to talk about a very important topic of personalizing risk reduction in heart, heart failure with the Indian context. That's the important thing. Good evening. And thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me to participate in this wonderful conference. I'm so excited and um, honored to be here. Um, as mentioned, the purpose of this discussion is to contextualize personalizing risk reduction in heart failure in India. Here's a brief outline for the discussion. We'll start by talking about the evolving epidemiology of heart failure in India, discuss non-traditional risk enhancers and how they may be applied in the Indian context, and identify strategies for prevention to reverse these unfavorable trends in heart failure burden. The growing epidemic of heart failure in India is of grave concern. In this very nice review paper published this past year in Circulation Heart Failure, with many co-authors also presenting here, 
the prevalence of heart failure was estimated to be between 1.3 and 4.6 million, and the annual incidence estimated between 500,000 to 1.8 million new cases occurring. There are important demographic differences as well in the population that is developing heart failure in India. S smaller registries like the Trivandrum Heart Failure Registry identified that the average age of heart failure among patients in India in this registry was 61 and that the majority of patients were men and had a history of hypertension and diabetes. Now, this is very important given comparisons to other Western countries in Europe where the average age of heart failure is older and may be more likely related to um, the similar risk factors with obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Ischemic heart disease accounted for a large proportion of heart failure cases, over 72%, and 45% of individuals had an ejection fraction less than 35%. In-hospital mortality was also high and approached 9%, and 90-day mortality accounted for another 15 to 20%. So in addition to being very high burden, the demographics are also one of concern given the loss of productive life years. Now, why is this happening? What are the risk factors that we need to think about when we think about the changing epidemiology? There are many epidemiologic transitions that are also happening during this time. We know that the mean age of the population is increasing and life expectancy has increased dramatically in the last two decades. While that's a very positive thing, we know that this may contribute to a greater burden of heart failure as the population ages. Concurrently, rates of obesity, severe obesity, and especially visceral adiposity are increasing. And in parallel, rates of diabetes and coronary heart disease are increasing. These are primary risk factors for heart failure and may be contributing to the growing burden. In the, to really contextualize what the problem is, national surveillance strategies are needed. And this very wonderful um, paper outlines the design and rationale for the National Heart Failure Registry in India and will seek to follow more than 10,000 patients who are identified and hospitalized with heart failure throughout India. In addition to knowing that the demographics may be different, they may be different across areas in India. And one of the big questions is, are we seeing a growing burden of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, given the car cardiometabolic risk, or more heart failure with reduced ejection fraction following ischemic heart disease? These centers are participating across India and will identify patients who are eligible with clinical heart failure, recruit, identify baseline data, and follow for up to one year to be able to identify what are the main risk factors, not only for the initial hospitalization for heart failure, but prognosis following that. While we have excellent strategies for guideline-directed medical therapy that can be optimized for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we lack such strategies for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and it's important to understand the demographic and the type of heart failure that we're seeing. In addition, Unfortunately, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are also seeing growing rates of heart failure related to this infection, as well as survival following the infection. One core aspect of this may be the overlapping features in pathophysiology that have been observed between heart failure and COVID-19, and the central role of inflammation in both of these conditions. In addition, similar demographics, such as older age, prevalence of obesity and diabetes that are associated with greater severity of infection may also be driving future burden of heart failure. In the midst of a growing epidemic of heart failure in the pandemic, we may be seeing growing rates of both heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction following the pandemic. If we take a step back and think about how to approach this problem, we know that symptomatic heart failure, identifying people once they come into the hospital, is really just the tip of the iceberg in a minority of patients. And what's below the surface is really identifying and shifting our focus to prevention of heart failure. And in order to be able to successfully do this, I propose that we need to think about three important topics. Identification of risk-enhanced populations, who is at greatest risk and who do we need to identify to target for prevention? 
how do we approach this in a risk-based precision approach for prevention? And what are the implementation of effective therapies that are then needed once we identify who is at risk to prevent progression to symptomatic heart failure? If we look at the stages of heart failure in this very nice diagram that the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association identified back in 2013, one of the reasons I really like the schematic is it helps to identify the entire spectrum and starts really at the beginning where stage zero is where we ideally want the majority of the population to be, where there are no risk factors, progressing to stage A for having risk factors like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, but no structural heart disease. Stage B, the presence of structural heart disease like left ventricular hypertrophy, but no signs or symptoms. And these are the individuals that we're really speaking about who are at greatest risk for heart failure that we need to better classify and identify before they shift into stages C and D with symptomatic heart failure. Now, there may be a point of no return when somebody is hospitalized given the neurohormonal alterations that occur and especially in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction for which we have no therapies that prolong survival or modify disease, prevention is of utmost um, importance. So how do we think about identifying risk? It's very common to think about diabetes, hypertension, obesity. We know these are key drivers for heart failure. But in the US, in one of our publications, we recently identified that over 50% of heart failure is not attributed to these traditional risk factors. So what are the non-traditional risk enhancers that we really need to be thinking about? Now, this diagram really outlines in a very comprehensive manner what a complex syndrome heart failure is. And that's part of the challenge. We've identified a syndrome based on symptoms of volume overload and congestion, but the underlying pathobiology may be very different from one patient who has rheumatic heart disease and develops heart failure to another who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and develops heart failure to another who has an MI and develops heart failure following that ischemic insult. On the most leftmost side of the screen are input factors, lifestyle factors, other epigenetic factors, economic and social factors, cultural factors, and healthcare context factors in terms of resources. And we know that all of these inputs are related to the core risk factors that we think of, both traditional and infectious, as well as non-traditional risk factors that ultimately lead to structural changes and subsequently symptoms of heart failure. I propose that what we really need to focus on are earlier in this upstream focus where we are identifying what the risk factors are and acting upon them so that we don't see development of LV hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, and systolic dysfunction. In order to do this, we need to understand what the key risk enhancers are. And we know that many end organ conditions like fatty liver disease, COPD, chronic kidney disease, which are highly prevalent, also contribute to heart failure risk. Inflammatory conditions and infectious conditions like HIV and COVID-19 are emerging as important risk factors. And adverse pregnancy outcomes in women are a key risk factor that are emerging as an important identifier of risk early in the life course gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, preterm delivery are important and prevalent risk factors to be aware of. So we'll go through a couple of um, papers that identify the risk of heart failure associated with these risk enhancers. Now in the UK Biobank, about 200,000 women were enrolled between the ages of 40 and 69 and were asked about their pregnancy and reproductive history. And shown in this first graph are the differences in hypertension in midlife based on a history of hypertensive disorder of pregnancy or gestational hypertension. And you can see in the red bar that the prevalence of hypertension was far higher in midlife for those women who had had a pregnancy complication of gestational hypertension. And on the right panel, we see that this was associated with an increased risk, not only of heart failure, but also coronary artery disease, aortic stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. If we look at renal disease and look at EGFR and UACR especially, this very nice study from the Chronic Renal Insufficiency Cohort or CRIC study in the US showed that in over 3,000 participants who had renal insufficiency related to diabetes, hypertension, or other findings, had a very high rate of incident heart failure. And the primary subtype of heart failure was heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, 
compared with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And what they showed in this graph is that with lower EGFR, higher UACR, and a combination of low EGFR and high UACR, there were higher rates of incident heart failure over the study period. In terms of lung disease, this is another major risk factor, and often we see the co-occurrence of chronic lung disease as well as heart failure. We spoke briefly about COVID-19 and upper respiratory infections, but what about early signs of lung impairment? We know that there are many factors that can contribute to impaired lung health, even in the absence of COPD and severe restrictive disease or ILD, early signs of lung disease can contribute to risk of cardiovascular events as well. In this study, in the coronary artery risk development in young adults study, they assessed the lung function with spirometry in over 5,000 young white and black adults aged 18 to 30 years. And then they looked over the next 30 years to identify the risk of cardiovascular events. And what they identified was that baseline lung function was associated with incident heart failure, but not coronary artery disease. And they looked at this at two time points over the study period at the baseline study, as well as 10 years after, and had repeated measurements of spirometry to look at how lung function changed and identified that lung function declined for all individuals over this time period, but that incident heart failure was identified even in the absence of severe restrictive or obstructive disease. Now, this can be important related to tobacco exposure, but only 20% of those with impaired lung health had tobacco exposure, which makes us wonder if there are other key contributors like air pollution that can be subsequently leading to inflammatory pathways and in increasing the risk of heart failure. So how do we put all of this together to identify strategies for the prevention of heart failure? I think we need to look at this in a three-way approach. First, multivariable risk scoring methods so we can quantify and identify who is at greatest risk. Second, using biomarkers as potentially sequential screening once we've identified who's at risk to reclassify and personalize that risk. And finally, optimization of guideline-directed medical therapy for prevention. We speak about guideline-directed medical therapy once an individual has systolic dysfunction, and I propose that we need to shift that formula upstream. We recently published the 10-year risk equations for incident heart failure in a general population after pooling data from over 23,000 adults in the United States across the United States shown here in the various cities. And what we identified was that there were key risk factors that were associated with heart failure when integrated in a risk calculator available here at pcphf.org, we could identify reliably the risk of developing heart failure over the next 10 years. Our risk calculator did not identify subtypes of heart failure, such as HEFPEF versus HEFREF, but created an overall staging system to identify who may be at risk for heart failure for further testing, like biomarkers and ultrasound and MRI. Thinking about a biomarker-based approach or a strategy trial, data from the STOP HF study were really one of the earliest um, studies of this kind to say we need to use risk factors or risk scores to identify who may be at risk and then propose an algorithm whereby everybody gets a screening BNP. We already utilize things like lipid panels and glucose or HbA1c to screen, we should be thinking about whether BNP can be included in that screening algorithm as well, given the morbidity and mortality related to heart failure. Now in this study, what they did was randomize individuals to either the screening approach, and then those who had a BNP over 50, they recommended further guideline-directed medical therapy like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, compared with those who received usual primary care. And what they saw were those individuals in the intervention had a lower incidence of systolic and diastolic dysfunction as well as incident heart failure. Pontiac HF was a study, another study done in Europe where they applied a similar type of algorithm, but here they used NT pro BNP and identified who the patients were that had an elevated NT pro BNP and then randomized them to usual care versus intervention with again, focusing on ACE inhibitors and other therapies and identified a lower risk of incident heart failure in this small population. Both of these were smaller studies, 
um, done in single countries and need to be externally validated, but identify this new approach and strategy to identifying risk and treating those at highest risk. Another thing that we need to think about when we personalize risk is what are the genetic contributors that may be identifying increased risk of heart failure. Now the MYBPC3 variant has been associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in multiple studies, but one of the most interesting variants is this 25 base pair deletion that has been reported to be fairly common in the Indian population and estimated to be about 4%. And this really um, very sophisticated paper in Nature Genetics, the authors looked at six different populations across South Asia and consistently identified a high prevalence, about four to six percent, and an odds ratio that ranged from two to 13 for incident heart failure. This study has also been replicated in South Asians living in the United States and identified another variant similarly on the MYBPC3 gene that may be contributing to heart failure risk. Given how common this variant is, it's unclear how penetrant it is, but may be a way to screen populations for those at greater risk or may be more vulnerable because of this variant. I propose what we really need to think about is not just a single size fits all approach in heart failure risk or treatment. Thinking about approaches with multi-level omics or a liquid biopsy as inspired by our oncology colleagues, we have a lot to learn for how to classify individuals, utilize quantitative multimodality imaging, exercise-based phenotyping for people who we would identify based on their response to exertion, and machine learning and artificial intelligence to really better phenotype and identify discrete groups that may benefit from differential therapy and follow-up. All of this is really now predicated on the excitement and enthusiasm around a specific therapy, SGLT2 inhibitors. In this meta-analysis that of course now is outdated, the authors pooled um, participants from the Emperad Canvas and Declare Timmy trials and identified a similar risk reduction for heart failure in those with a history and without a history of heart failure with a uh, robust hazard ratio of 0.7. Similarly, we now have data from patients with CKD and HEFREF who don't even have diabetes. And excitingly, these um, drugs are really beneficial, not just because of their benefit on glucose lowering, but naturesis and inflammation. So I'll conclude with these key takeaway moments and say that I think heart failure is preventable. We need to identify what the risk enhanced populations are, use multivariable risk calculation, biomarkers, and potentially incorporate SGLT2 inhibitors into our algorithms. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you, Sadia. Dr. Natarajan, please go ahead. That's something about exercise-based uh, phenocopy or something you said. Can you add a short comment on what you meant? Absolutely. One of the things that we have found very challenging is identifying risk um, in patients who may have exercise impaired symptoms, but do not yet have congestion or volume overload. So if we are able to do cardiopulmonary exercise testing or exercise based echo and identify those who have impaired strain or impaired um, hemodynamics, specifically when they exercise, we may be able to shift the identification of heart failure upstream. So that was a very excellent talk, uh, exhaustively co covering a very important topic about uh, reducing the risk reduction particularly. Uh, actually, your talk was not just Indian context, it was in the global context as well. Thank you very much for that excellent talk. And uh, Dr. Kaul, you want to add some more points? Uh, no, I think it was a very you know good and informative talk covering almost all the aspects. And I only hope that we should be able to even partly practice this. Thank you, Sadia. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So carry on. Dr. Natarajan for the Nish Neha so, is there. Yes. So the, the last talk uh, will be by Dr. Neha, who will speak on inflammatory heart disease, why a cardiologist should be concerned. Looking forward to your talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Neha. Thank you very much. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Um, 
There's a problem with my screen share. Um, Madam, madam, just close this. Ah, yes, ma'am. Put on slideshow, ma'am, please. Yeah. Is that is that is that visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Very much, very much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So, without much ado, if I may start. Um, so, I'd like to uh, firstly thank the organisers for inviting me to this um, excellent symposium, and um, I'm going to be talking to you on inflammatory heart disease. And the reason why um, I chose this topic was because uh, over the past many years, cardiologists have mainly been focused on treatment strategies of uh, prevention and treatment of ischemic heart disease. And uh, inflammatory heart disease or myocarditis in, in this context is largely considered as, um, as, as, a, as a new kid on the block. Uh, so without much ado, um, in essence, myocarditis is a uh, non coronary cause of, um, of inflammation of heart muscle. And uh, throughout this talk, uh, using clinical vignettes, uh, I hope to impress upon you uh, as to why cardiologists, we need to realize this and be aware of our strengths and limitations when um, faced with such cases, because they have a great, uh, um, we can really influence patient management as I'll hope to highlight with some of the cases. So we know that myocarditis is common. And um, from what we learn from past is that about 40% of cases of myocarditis resolve spontaneously. And especially those with mild and minimal symptoms of dysfunction, but the disease burden is not insignificant, as you can see with this graph. Um, these patients can present acutely with chest pain, and we and others have shown that about 60% with so-called culprit-free angiograms uh, will have had a myocardial inflammation. It's a common cause of sudden death. Uh, it's a common cause of patients presenting with dilated cardiomyopathy, and not that infrequently patients can present with fulminant heart failure. And symptoms and phenotypes can uh, overlap. And as a cause or as a result of this, um, they can be posing a significant clinical challenge. So if you look at this 17-year-old, she presents with, uh, with fever, chest pain, troponin elevation, normal ECG and a bedside echocardiogram showing significant LV dysfunction. She was quite sick and the working diagnosis was septic shock uh, with myocardial compromise. She had an MRI on the second day when she was reasonably stable because she'd been having non-sustained BT and the red arrows show you non-ischemic pattern of scar and the diagnosis was made myocarditis. She had swinging temperatures and an evanescent rash. And the concern here was we're missing an obvious septic focus. She undergoes an extensive uh, diagnostic panel to look for causes of sepsis. And the answer lay in this humble hematenics, which were done because she was anemic. And you can see that the ferritin was over um, 78,000. So with multidisciplinary team effort, uh, we managed to make a diagnosis of adult onset Stills disease. And if this had not been made and left untreated, it would have been fatal. Um, she is now four years on follow-up and is relatively stable and off any regular medication. Uh, contrast this with a 44-year-old gentleman who presents with troponin elevation, chest pain, no previous medical history, non-sustained VT on his admitting um, angiogram. He gets cardioverted to sinus rhythm and a coronary angiogram is performed, which is normal. Um, he, the echocardiogram um, shows some asymmetry, raising suspicion of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and CMR shows 
co-localized patterns of late gadolinium enhancement as shown by the red arrows, and you also see extensive edema. Now we know this doesn't look like, this is not a heart attack, the coronaries were normal. This doesn't look like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy either. So what is it? Uh, we do an extensive respiratory examination, which was predominantly unremarkable. The chest X-ray, HRCT, lung volumes, all did not show any obvious abnormalities. We went on to do an endomyocardial biopsy, and this shows um, there is late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, the, sorry, the bronchoscopy then, um, so no, no real answers to the endomyocardial biopsy. And then we revisit, she undergoes a transbronchial um, uh, ultrasound, and the answer was sarcoidosis in the view of the presence of non uh, caseating granulomas. This is another case who presents with pericarditic chest pain uh, with preceding flu like illness, trop elevation, uh, some previous history, um, past bit of smoking, bit of occasional recreational drugs, normal clinical examination, and we were very reassured with normal CMR findings. But the troponin remains uh, elevated and is unexplained. The symptoms are recurrent, so are we missing anything? We went on to do an extensive blood examination and the uh, ANA teeters were elevated and a subsequent diagnosis of lupus was made two years down the line. So I hope I've convinced you that myocarditis by itself is not a diagnosis and it's important to look for causes. Um, just like one would approach, uh, for example, heart failure, you need to look for the cause of heart failure. With myocarditis, too, you need to know what is causing myocarditis, just like you would do with fever. Um, this is one such table. It's no uh, it's not exhaustive by any means, but it's just something to trigger thought process. Uh, and this is the approach that is recommended um, to try and look for infective, immune-mediated, or toxic causes of myocardial inflammation. Um, so if we move on to diagnosis, the key uh, to making a diagnosis of myocarditis is having a clinical suspicion. And it's perhaps the most important thing that as clinicians we need to consider. Uh, routine tests have little or no uh, sensitivity or specificity for myocarditis. Troponin elevation is what commonly triggers involvement of cardiologists, and it's important that we embrace this opportunity to um, make a difference to the outcome of the patient group, as shown by the examples of the case studies previously. One has to also recognize that troponin rise does not equate with acute coronary syndrome. And it's a message that as cardiologists, we need to be aware of. Troponin release, it's sensitive to detect even a small amount of myocardial injury, but not the underlying reason for it. ECG has very limited diagnostic value. An echocardiogram is easily available, um, but it's not uh, sensitive or specific to inflammation. CMR, on the other hand, has revolutionized the way we approach or understand the concept or this phenotype of, uh, of myocardial inflammation. Uh, as with everything, interpretation of CMR is also very dependent on the clinical context and can aid you with understanding the function, morphology, and pattern of injury that you might see on these scans. Um, in an appropriate context, the pattern of late gadolinium enhancement can reasonably help you understand the, 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 the disease or the etiology. However, if we were to just rely on, um, on, the, on, on the finding that we see uh, on CMR scan, um, it may not be true in all occasions. So here are three case examples of three patients presenting with myocarditis, not too dissimilar from each other, but how do you know what will happen to each of them? And um, as you may be surprised by the fact, the first patient uh, recovered completely, the second went on to develop heart failure, and the third died within two days of presentation.
Can endomyocardial biopsy help? It's a gold standard and has been strongly endorsed by guidelines. Um, but myocarditis, as you know, can be patchy. And in this very um, well uh, quoted study, you see that um, the sensitivity was about 82% only if you took 17 biopsy specimens. It's a bit difficult to do that in a sick uh, and live patient. Uh, this is a 44-year-old nurse who presented with no previous history, but with chest pain and a significant troponin T elevation. Uh, the coronaries were normal. Peripheral blood screen did not allude to any obvious etiology. Um, she had an echo which showed severe LV dysfunction, confirmed again on CMR scan. And the various parametric imaging using cardiac MRI shows that there is inflammation but it didn't tell us what is causing this inflammation. So we went on to do an endomyocardial biopsy and that just shows lymphocytic myocarditis. Again, we do not know what triggered or what caused her to have uh, this episode of lymphocytic myocarditis. So she gets treated with heart failure medication. She gets an empirical treatment with a short course of steroids and she recovers in about six months. So the question that is being asked is, will she relapse? And which markers do we use for follow-up? The answers to these questions are not clear. Uh, we don't know if this is a viral trigger. Uh, is this an autoimmune process? Is this a viral infection which is triggering an autoimmune uh, process? Is there underlying genetic susceptibility? So all these questions uh, need to be, answers need to be found to them. Um, this was a 17-year-old male we saw in 2010 uh, when he presented with chest pain. The ECG showed inferior ST elevation. The TROP was positive. He was too young and coronary disease was very unlikely. He was also febrile. There was a bit of a uh, history of previous viral infection. So the working diagnosis was likely viral myocarditis. Um, the CMR scan done on the second day of admission shows extensive circumferential uh, edema, again, making us fairly reassured that this was uh, myocarditis. Two months later, he has a follow-up scan. The edema gets better. We are functionally and clinically reassured that he's stable. And he's been under follow-up. And seven years later, we still see persistent scar, as pointed by the white arrows, which was the same pattern that was there even on day two. The history was revisited again, and this time we went on to uh, do a genetic panel, and we found that he had a desmal plaquin mutation. So is this somebody who has an inherent predisposition to develop a viral myocarditis, or was this presentation seven years ago part of a spectrum of his inherited cardiomyopathy? And we know that um, this may be relevant um, because we know that desmosomes are an integral part of the disease spectrum that we are understanding uh, the different mechanisms of injury pattern in patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, if you look at ARVC, heart phases in this disease condition are being increasingly appreciated. So therefore, if we were to conclude our, uh, our approach to uh, looking for etiology in patients with myocarditis, in addition to infections, immune uh, mediated toxic co causes, heart phases of inherited heart disease also need to be considered. So if I begin to try and uh, conclude, uh, myocarditis can present with uh, multiple clinical presentations and the etiology needs to be considered in the clinical context. Clinicians Primarily, cardiologists need to have a high index of clinical suspicion. Troponin rise, normal coronaries, is no longer an acceptable diagno um, discharge diagnosis. And hot phases of inherited cardiac disease may present as myocarditis. So it is important that we develop a multidisciplinary approach with cardiologists at the heart of this diagnostic strategy. And this is the kind of flow algorithm that we have at our center. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, thank you for the time and uh, thank all my team who've helped us uh, put this program forward.
and to the faculty for allowing me to present this data to you today. Thank you very much, Neha, for this very comprehensive discussion on a very difficult subject. Actually, myocarditis is, uh, you know, comes in such a different ways and the prognosis is so variable. As you also showed, some recover completely and some get into, you know, very bad and, you know, uh, progressive disease and uh, the management strategies are not uh, pretty straightforward and uh, doing everything like a myocardial biopsy and uh, getting a reliable report of the biopsy or, you know, some of the challenges which we face here. So uh, what is your perspective of, uh, you know, how far we should go for investigating them? So I think it's a very common... Um... <laughs> So we, we started, um, um, if it, it came home to us, and the question you ask is commonly asked in, the, um, in, in, in any cardiology uh, firm, and what do you do? I think the one approach is that um, every opportunity, every myocarditis patient, if you, at the first time a cardiologist interacts, you need to to take a detailed uh, context. And if there is a clear uh, predisposed, you know, there's a preceding history of viral illness and you can clearly demonstrate that there is nothing else amiss, I think that would be reasonable. Um, so um, if, if I, I, I suppose you're asking me to say in, in, in a country like India where there might be resource implications and lots of disease presentation. So, I think the key thing what we as clinicians and should promote are the tra being trained is that history taking should be very, very comprehensive because um, you can you can try and look for various other causes, but good history taking first instance. Um, ECG and an echo at the very least would be what I would suggest because if you start seeing worrying features, if you see ventricular dysfunction, you see pericardial effusions, um, you know that this patient is not doing very well. Um, that would be my, the bare minimum that I would, I would, I would, I would sort of suggest, um, depending on the setting where you have, um, uh, where you're practicing and what you're doing. Um, obviously, if you do have the resources then uh, we would insist on a cardiac MRI as a baseline yeah. in any case. Um, that's, that's, that's the strategy I would do. The, with regards to blood testing, I think the one thing that leads a trigger to looking for the cause is troponin. Um, but uh, whether you should be doing viral markers and stuff, you rarely pick things up. Um, and maybe in a research setting. So we tend to do them because we're trying to understand more clearly the, the, the utility and the usefulness. Uh, but I guess that will just be dependent on what your labs and what the population resources um, are available to you. And what kind of therapy would you start while the patient is being investigated besides the heart failure drugs, which uh, depends upon his hemodynamic status, the dosages and other things depend upon that. Yeah. Any specific therapies? <laughs> so, um, I, I think, um, so I'll tell you what our approach is and there is no data. In fact, we, we, we're, um, we're considering doing, um, a, you know, we need to have some randomized control data. It's very difficult to get so if a patient presents with fulminant myocarditis, and if you look at the, the old papers that, um, that have been published by Dr. Cooper, um, for fulminant myocarditis, if early on in the presentation, you can um, help and stabilize the patient, they tend to do reasonably well. But if they are unsupported and you can't do them, then the decline is very rapid. Um, in the absence of any obvious contraindications um, and after a very quick and basic comprehensive assessment, I tend to give them pulse methylprednisolone. Uh, 
Uh, it's not recommended. We don't have any guidelines for it, but that is something that can be considered um, and see how patients would respond to that depending on, on their presentation. So um, I wouldn't be want I wouldn't want to be quoted and saying that this is something that you should be giving, but depending on um, your clinical scenario, uh, if the patient is an extremist and you need to support them, provided there's nothing else that is completely contradictory to that, that is what we would give. With the limitations of uh, viral markers, as you said, it is often, the, even in the Indian context, Viral markers are the least uh, useful, I would say, even if it is where uh, viral myocarditis. How safe is to give high dose uh, pulse steroids uh, if it were to be viral myocarditis? Uh, so, um, I think if you if you follow the ESC guidelines, then they say you must do a biopsy and wait and see how things are. Um, and we know that in the best possible institutes to get results from getting a endomyocardial biopsy, getting it analyzed, getting any PCR, viral PCR, anything on that, easily it will take minimum 48 to 48 plus hours. And those hours are very crucial for a patient if, you're, if, if it's a question of patients deteriorating. Um, I think if we have to learn some, something from the current COVID pandemic as well, steroids were a no-no, and then we realized there's dexamethasone is something that you could consider giving this group of patients with some, uh, you can probably help with the acute uh, cytokine storm, whatever you take it. So in the absence of data, I think you have to make a clinical judgment um, and one can only go by, uh, by your own experience till the such time that we have randomized controlled trial. We don't have that at the moment, it's anecdotal. So what we do have is a, uh, uh, so in our center, how we practice is um, we have a few like-minded um, consultant cardiologists. So it's all cardiologists at the, at the forefront. Um, we get a man who's a patient who's very septic. We think it's, it's myocarditis. And then we, we try and at least have one or two people brainstorm and try and make a decision. Should we go for this therapy or is there anything else that we can opt for? Um, it, I think it's very important to support the patient. And so, on biopsy, two questions on biopsy. How sure. safe is biopsy in such a sick patient? You said you have done 17 samples in a given case. And what is the yield of biopsy? So that, I haven't done 17. That's Dr. Cooper's paper. Um, that That's the paper that, that showed, and that was a post-mortem. So I think that's why my limitations is that um, biopsy is in the, in the, so, our take on that is uh, biopsy is endorsed by the guidelines. Our own clinical and practical experiences that uh, the yield can be uh, pretty difficult uh, or, or limited uh, when you have to approach such a patient. Um, with regards to safety, of course, you've got to, to see how experienced you are and what other support mechanisms you have. It's no good just doing a biopsy if you don't have the support of the pathology staff to go and report it. Um, at the most, we tend to take three or maybe five samples. You, you just can't take 17 samples. I mean, that, is, that can only be done in that paper because that was a post-mortem study. Yeah. It, you can't really do it in a live patient. So we need to use, we need to try and find new alternatives. Um, so we're doing, I didn't want to show too much of a clinical research, but there's been work done on looking at anti-desmoglyne antibodies by a group in Ontario our own centers looking at the role of CMET. So can we use peripheral markers to better identify and stratify these patients? So I think this is a very exciting time for myocarditis because there's a lot of interest and need and want to do things in that. Thank you very much. Dr. Cole, you can conclude. Thank you very much. And it was, you know, myocarditis is a difficult subject and it has so many varieties. So, but I think uh, in the last 20 minutes, we really had a very vast discussion, whatever we could do, and some of the algorithms. I'm sure the work will continue and the management strategies will go to get more, you know, uh, logical and proven with randomized studies. Thank you very much. I think we had a very useful session. Thank you very All much. the four talks were really very topical.
and I must thank all the speakers. Some of them are not with us, I think, right now. But uh, uh, on behalf of both of us and on behalf of the Cardiological Society of India, we thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Very and kind. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, good morning to you and good night to you, Dr. Kaur. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So good night all sir good night thank, thank you, you sir thank you thank you bye bye Silakar, India's number one CCB in management of hypertension. Myotan, Myotan CM. Bisotan.